and Gary, I think I actually got through it. Uh, let's go ahead and take a first question for Mark, and I'm going to ask the panel to come up. Now, for uh, uh, time management, I'm going to quickly repeat the question. Come on up, panel, and, and have a seat. Uh, and then uh, I'll pass the microphone to them, and uh, uh, then uh, we'll go. So who has a question for Mark while the others are coming up? Yes. The question is, Mark has got mostly uh, endophyte infected tall fescue. The question is, what about, has he considered switching to a novel endophyte variety? Yes, I have considered it, but the point that I made is a lot of my ground is going to be hard to convert. Uh, I am, and that's kind of coming from me because I'm a member of, we've We've got this uh, Fescue Endified Alliance in Missouri with the seed companies, the university and NRCS, and I was a member on that, still am, uh, that committee. Uh, but I've got some acreages that, I, that are going to be easier to convert that I, I probably will. Now, I will say the one thing, on my operation with the goats, I haven't seen as big of a uh, economic impact with the goats as I did when I was running cattle. Uh, and part of that may be due to my selection because I, I severely call my goats uh, based on their performance, parasite resistance, and I um, developed kind of a low maintenance bunch of goats. So I'm not seeing quite the economic uh, change there. Now questions for uh, any of the panel, and I'm just, Mark, you can go ahead and have a seat, and I'll just pass that down. They can stand up. So who has a question? or any of the other panel members. Uh, yes. Does anybody manage for dung beetles? Does anyone manage for dung beetle? Who wants to, any dung beetle problem? Mark? In, in, in Missouri, a lot of our guys that are, are, are grazing, especially the ones that are in management intensive grazing, uh, dung beetle and, and observing those and monitoring that and doing some things uh, you know, watching what kind of herbicides, insecticides, especially the pesticides from the insecticide, either internal or external uh, insects, uh, watching some of that, the rotational grazing, the rest periods, and, and some different things that we're really uh, keying in on and, and trying to watch that dung beetle earthworm populations. And uh, same thing on my goats. and. Organic matter is one of those things too, and I know with four and a half percent organic matter, I see more earthworms and, and dung beetles than I did at two percent. Next question for uh, any of the speakers. Also, I'll open it up for the previous, the other speakers, uh, uh, Scott uh, and uh, Marvin, if you have it as well. So, question for any of them. I realize that we are uh, getting close to the lunch, but I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, one thing I think you would agree with me that I did a good job of putting together some very quality speakers this morning, and they covered a lot of your questions in their presentation. And So who has another question? And Terry, by the way, I apologize for not getting your – they were in there, some kind of electronic glitch, but she's got a wonderful family, and stop by my room after a while, I'll show you that picture. I've got it. Okay. Uh, let me ask a question by a show of hands. I believe I heard every one of you say that all of you soil test. Is that correct? What about forage analysis? How many of you run forage analysis sometime during the year for quality? Okay. Okay. So, so that. How many of you use uh, improved varieties in, in all of your seedings? Okay. Okay. So there, there's a consistent pattern here, isn't it? Okay. Who had another question? I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, question is from John Rogers in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and basically asked about use of herbicides uh, and the environment. Okay, so the question is about herbicides and environment. You know, we rigorously, rigorously test these herbicides 
they have to pass a screening with certain animals, with uh, they have to, uh, certain birds, fish species, what have you. And the way we look at it, if you stay within our label, if you apply those herbicides like we ask, you should not see any environmental impacts. Uh, especially these new herbicides like amino pyrrolid that you find in Grazon Next, uh, uh, Forefront HL, Chaparral. Amino pyrrolid has been classified as basically non-toxic. In the EPA trials, they could not get them high enough to see any adverse effects in animals. We've never seen any adverse effects in, in, in soil organisms with those either. So as far as being concerned about the environment, unless you're going out there and dumping jugs in a lake, uh, I'm not too concerned. As long as you stay into the, with, uh, within that label, everything's good. The, the, like the, the old saying goes, the, the poison's in the dose. So. Okay. And uh, always, as we always say, read and follow uh, uh, label directions is critically important. Now, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Clayton a question. You know, I've, been wor I've worked with a lot of farmers for a lot of years, and I've been working with Clayton for many years. I don't know of anyone that I know keeps better records than he does. When gas prices started going up a few years ago, uh, I was at Clayton's farm talking to him about it. He could tell me exactly how much of that impacted per bale of hay. He can tell me all of those, and, and I think that's a very important point, and each one of these speakers made critically important points that I think if all of us will think about it and apply it, it will improve all of our operation. Now, I saw another hand over here. Yes, back here. Greg. Yeah, Clayton, as, as your input costs go up, uh, does your delivery costs uh, go up? I, I can, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in our operation, I can tell you right now, uh, and it varies just a little bit based on yield, but uh, we get about 25 bales of hay per gallon harvested. That's cutting, tattering, raking, baling, and setting it in the barn. So for every gallon of fuel we buy, we get to put 25 bales of hay in the barn. From my barn to most where I go in Lexington, it averages about 120 miles. And, it, and I only get about 14 bales per gallon for hauling the hay 120 miles. So it takes me twice as much fuel to deliver hay 120 miles as it does to, to, to put it, to completely harvest it. So it takes a lot, lot more fuel to deliver it than it does to put it in the barn. Do you pass that on to your customers? All of our, uh, the question was, do we pass the cost of, um, of delivery on to the customer? All of our hay is priced at our barn. Uh, we ship hay as far away as 800 miles and as close as across the road. So our, our hay is all priced at the barn, and uh, we will deliver it ourselves within a 150-mile radius. We will arrange delivery to anywhere, any place. Thank you, Clayton. And, and one thing that he didn't add that I've noticed, I'll go to his farm, and he'll have, did I do that? Uh, anyway, he'll have uh, 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 trailers lined up out there, and a lot of times customers will just bring their trailers. He'll fill them up, and they come and get it. When they take that, they'll bring him an empty. So he's got a, a really good system. Next question. Was there one right back here? I saw a hand. Uh, yeah. Do you use that because it's not high-protein for animals, or have you had it uh, tested towards just... Uh, basically, the question is the brassicas, uh, about the quality of them. <laughs> I'm a mom. I can multitask. I got this. Okay, the question was on the kale. Uh, the kale was grown at my parents' farm, and it was part of a study done by Michigan State University. Uh, they provided the seed. I am not sure what uh, the study was for. However, um, in the category of the brassicas, we do the pasture turnips, and um, for, we'll say, a couple of reasons. The first reason is uh, when we outwinter, those paddocks need reseeded. And so what we do is we go in with our pasture mix and the turnips. Now the turnips will be from seed to feed in 30 days. And so what the turnips do for us is get the cows back on that paddock grazing uh, within 30 days, whereas our pasture mix would not be established as quickly. So that paddock would be sitting out doing nothing for us longer. And we need all of our paddocks in feed all the time, you know, because we are at our, 
our stocking rate. So the turnips do that. They aerate the soil, so the next year our pasture mix is phenomenal. The best paddocks on our farm will be the paddocks that follow the turnips. And uh, the cows milk excellent on them. We always go up and milk when they're on the turnips. Uh, Robert, question for you. Uh, you work uh, with the Virginia Forage Council and things. You've got a very efficient grazing operation. Over the last five or ten years, have you seen a big increase uh, in grazing in your state? Gary, th this is anecdotal information, but I think we have. I think for many, many, many years, I actually studied under Roy Blazer back in the uh, late 70s. And he was talking about some of the same things that I'm talking about now 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, but I do think in the past several years, we, we have seen an increase, and it may very well be economic driven. I mean, before, it's always been economical, but when you get fuel prices going up, equipment costs going up, I mean, it just starts to make sense. The other little piece of information I will share with you is when we have grazing conferences in Virginia, I believe our attendance and interest by producers have, have gone up. So this grazing deal and for many years has been the right place at the right time, and I don't think it's any better than it is right now. Okay, do we have another question that I missed there? Yes, in the back. Yes. Gary, maybe, maybe more of a comment than a question. I'll agree with you, first of all, that, yeah, you picked a lot of really good friends, and they made you look good today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. What an outstanding summary of the conference. Give Bill a big round of applause. Now, in, in case you didn't uh, know who that was speaking, those of you in the back, that's former past president uh, Bill Tucker, a uh, member of this organization uh, for many, many years, a leader in the Virginia Forage, worked for our organization in Washington, D.C. for many years, and I think he's done an excellent job of summarizing at least my thoughts of where we're at today. Folks, I want to say uh, a big round of applause to all the speakers. I don't think that I could have selected a better group. And then I also want to say to Dave Owens and all the, uh, the staff of Dow AgriSciences just how much we appreciate uh, your support of this symposium, your support of the American Forage and Grassland Council, and of forage-based ag culture worldwide. We appreciate the leadership that you continue to provide and the tremendous investment that you're making in ag culture, and we encourage you to keep up the good work. Folks, we're going to adjourn for lunch. Uh, you've got, I think, 15 minutes to get over. Thank you for coming. And, Lynn, I hope you got a picture when you took it a while ago of the standing room only. Now, we need to make sure that we, we do what Bill said, point out that there's interest in forages and what uh, uh, Robert just talked about, the, the opportunities for quality animal products from quality forages has never been higher. Let's capitalize on that. Take off. These folks will be around. If you have any additional questions, come and visit with them. Thank all of you speakers again. Great job.